I'm in Washington, D.C. My name is Jeff Gedman with American Purpose, and it is our delight and honor to do today's program together with America's Public Forum, a project and initiative of Braver Angels. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about this program because I'm going to turn it over to Luke, Luke Nathan Phillips of Braver Angels, to do a tech talk and introduce the program properly. Uh, I will say we're delighted that you all are with us. We'll have time for Q&A the second half before a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern. There is chat open, both in the discussion and in chat. I ask you all to use that respectfully, be concise, be part of a conversation and open things up. Don't close things down, as they say. Those are the rules of the road, but we're delighted. Don Kettle, welcome. Susie Garment, what a pleasure. We'll hear more about both of you. Don, your book, Princeton University Press on Federalism and the Divided States of America in moments. But right now, Luke Phillips, you have the floor. Set us up, getting, get us going. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Jeff. It's always a pleasure to work with you all. So uh, howdy, everybody. My name is Luke Nathan Phillips. I uh, work with Braver Angels, and this event is being hosted as an America's Public Forum event. Uh, for those who have uh, been to uh, various America's Public Forums, you'll recall that the, uh, the, the hope and the vision of the, uh, of the program is to connect the world of grassroots depolarization and uh, red-blue civil discourse with the world of deep and thoughtful scholarship and activism and journalism on similar and related issues of direct importance to American public life in the 21st century. And American Purpose has been a wonderful partner for a lot of these events, and we look forward to continuing to work with them, uh, not only on this event, but on many more events further, uh, further onward in the future. So uh, Jeff, thanks for, for working with, uh, with us on this. So uh, with that, let me do just a very quick tech talk, and then I will introduce our speakers for the day. Uh, first off, some of you who registered through Braver Angels uh, received a link that has uh, that uh, has you named Luke Phillips, and for what it's worth, I've always thought it's good for there to be more Luke Phillipses in the world. Uh, but uh, for the uh, for the the ease of uh, Q and A management, it would be helpful if you could rename yourself from my name, Luke Phillips, to whatever your actual name is. We would appreciate that a lot. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so a couple quick uh, quick notes for uh, for Tech Talk. So there are two of us in here who are labeled ZEM. Those are myself, Luke Nathan Phillips, and Robert Bork. Uh, Robert and myself are the Zoom event managers. We're here to answer all of your tech questions if you need help, if you need to know where the recording is going to be, uh, and if you have uh, just tech issues or troubleshooting during the event, uh, feel free to send a chat specifically directly to either of us, and we will get on it to help you as soon as we can. Uh, second off, please keep yourself on mute over the course of the meeting until we get to Q&A. Uh, we will love to hear your voices and hear your, your, uh, your questions and, uh, and comments and thoughts as we get closer to the end of this. But we'd like to uh, have that in the second half and the first part will be our, uh, our conversation here. Um, and then uh, for you will note that the, the Q&A box is open. Uh, so feel free to use the chat box for, uh, for, uh, for commenting various thoughts you might have and questions as we get closer to it. Now, when we get to the actual Q&A itself, you're going to use the raise hands function. So please go ahead and raise your Zoom hand if you know how to raise your Zoom hand. Uh, that would just be a helpful test. Anybody raising their Zoom hands? I see a couple. Great, great, great. Awesome. Okay, thank you all. So uh, please put your hands down now, but uh, that is how... Uh, Suzanne Garment will know to call on you once we get a little bit closer to uh, to uh, to the Q and A. Uh, so uh, so yes. So um, this topic, uh, federalism, the role of federalism in the American federal system, its uh, possible uh, ways of how it's worked, its successes and failures. This is obviously something of direct and crucial importance to the American system of government. Uh, for all sorts of reasons that go from the high philosophical down to the pragmatic and, uh, and gritty and almost boring. It's something that is important for American life and the way we think about it and its evolution uh, is something that I think you know a lot of us have, uh, have opinions on. But we are joined tonight by a scholar who has dedicated a lot of his career to thinking very deeply about it and whose insights on it will be um, uh, will, I, I'm just excited to, uh, to see some of, the, uh, some of the, the ways to think about it as well. And so, um, so uh, obviously, it's a, it's a question of deep importance to American life nowadays, too. A lot of us in depolarization world, some of us have thought that 
uh, localism of various sorts can be a solution, right? And uh, I don't know what Don Kettle thinks about that, um, but I'll be excited to see how he can help all of us, regardless of where our views on the role of federalism in America uh, can and maybe should think about that. And so with that, though, uh, the, uh, the host, the MC who will be guiding us through, through this conversation is someone who has uh, done many great things in public and nonprofit life uh, and uh, is uh, the senior editor of American Purpose and just a wonderful writer and intellectual and thinker on her own right, uh, Suzanne Garment. Suzanne, thank you for hosting us in this, uh, in this event and looking forward to the conversation. Um, welcome to America's Public Forum, everyone. Luke, thank you. And uh, Don Kettle is one of America's most distinguished scholars, in particular, uh, an authority on American federalism and a man with impeccable timing because his book has appeared at a moment at which interest in federalism is at a peak. I, we can tell this in part by the number of people who have signed up for, for this Zoom conversation. Uh, Don has written a book about how federalism originated, how it has progressed, and why now it is in a kind of crisis. Uh, I am not going to impose myself further for a while. Uh, and I would just ask Don uh, to start us in. Why are we federalists? <laughs> Great question there, Susie. And greetings to everyone and welcome from Austin, Texas. I'm sitting right downtown and it's great to have a chance to be able to connect with all of you. And uh, there's a, one of the things that I had as we were working on the book was a kind of uh, a technical issue about how it is that I could get a cartoon by Benjamin Franklin into the book. And it turned out that the quality of the graphics from Franklin's work back in the mid 1700s was such that we couldn't actually make it work inside, but they did find a way to put it on the, on the cover. And what I wanna do is to, uh, to make sure everybody, I, this is the cover, but I, I love Franklin's uh, drawing here. This is allegedly, we believe, a, a cartoon that in fact Franklin put in his Pennsylvania Gazette. And what it has is a collection of states but the snake is sliced into pieces. And the motto, the caption underneath that was join or die. The question from the very beginning of American federalism has always been the question about how much joining we need to do and whether or not we're likely to die if we don't have enough of it. We have this long tradition of self-government in the United States and a profound distrust of central government uh, brought in part by the fact that we had to fight a revolution to free ourselves of the king. And in fact, if you go to see the musical Hamilton, that we see that the, the one major piece of comic relief is George III in it and his challenge of trying to find a way to uh, convince the colonists that they'll be back when in fact they weren't. So this is something that goes way back. To frame why this matters, and one of the points I want to make is that uh, it's federalism is something that frankly, I think most people feel find pretty boring most of the time. There was a time when virtually every political science department in the country would teach a course in federalism, but those days sadly are gone for the most part. There still are courses, but not nearly as many. There's a time when just about everybody felt that they had to learn about it to be able to make anything work. And I think that's probably not the case anymore either. But the argument that I wanna make is that if you begin to scratch on domestic policy in the United States, you find federalism lurking and hiding everywhere. Two points to try to frame this, one from the very recent and one from the very distant past. One is that there's a great op-ed in the Washington Post this morning of the Dean of the School of Public Health who compares the performance of two different states when it comes to COVID-19, South Dakota on the one side and Vermont on the other. And what he finds is that states of roughly similar population but where the death rate adjusted for population in South Dakota is six times higher than in Vermont, six times higher. And on the other hand, the argument was, well, uh, if, you, if you need to find a way to try to uh, balance the question of, of getting people vaccinated, it's to try to open up the economy. And it turns out that the unemployment rate in Vermont is lower than South Dakota, despite 
South Dakota's much more uh, freewheeling process of trying to find ways of managing the disease to the point that it's estimated that about half of all the people in South Dakota, half of all the people have been infected with COVID-19. So why did this happen? It happened because of very different, radically different policies in each of these states. So if there's a question about why it is that federalism matters, and perhaps why it is that we need to think about the question of what federal, whether federalism works, we'd only have to look at this important comparison between just these two states. And the deeper that you dig, the more that you see these variations. So the, that's the, the setup question there. The, the question is, why is it that federalism matters? And all you have to do is to look at Vermont versus South Dakota. To flip it back to the, the very beginning and uh, history on the other side, uh, back before, in fact, the, the founders of this country were thinking about creating a country, there was a, a gentleman by the name of, uh, of Edward Cave. And in 1731, he created a new magazine called The Gentleman's Magazine. Uh, sex is for sure, but his assumption was that, that ladies certainly wouldn't be even interested in reading the material on the inside. It was a kind of compendium of, of everything from corn prices to poetry to philosophy, uh, a, a magazine, if you will. He's in fact the guy who created the idea of a magazine borrowed from the French where magazine was a store. So the magazine was a kind of storehouse of different kinds of things. And anybody who was anybody, including the founders of the country, uh, would read the gentleman's magazine as it came out. And so the question that Cave had was, what kind of motto should we have for his magazine? And the thing that he chose was e pluribus unum. If you look, in fact, at the original cover, of the magazine that he created back in 1731, it was e pluribus unum, one from many. And so it was one magazine that was drawn from many different kinds of sources. But as the founders were looking around for a motto for the country, it was that motto that they chose. Absolutely fascinating in looking at the historical roots because e pluribus unum was not something that they dreamed up on their own, but a way to try to describe an answer to the problem that they were trying to create, to go back to the join or die problem for Benjamin Franklin, the question of how much national unity do we really need? And it was a question of creating one country out of different kinds of sources, out of different kinds of ideas and beliefs. That's what we created. We have in many ways the, the most complicated and uh, the, although the federal systems elsewhere, in many ways, the, the most mature and varied federal system in the world. And the question is, why does it matter? To answer the question of why it matters, as I said, we only have to look at the South Dakota versus Vermont comparison. So the question then is, I mean, how much national control should we have and how much local variation should we permit? And there are those these days who say that the answer to the problem is we need as much local variation as we can get, but it's clear looking at the comparison between South Dakota and Vermont that that has a significant cost to it. The question is, are we willing to put up with it in exchange for the degrees of liberty that citizens enjoy? The story between Edward Cave on, and the founders on the one side and the question of Vermont versus South Dakota on the other is a long and tangled one that I go through in the book. But I think that the, the basic question that we have and the basic problem that we've created through our system of federalism is that the idea of creating 50 different states each of which has the power to go its own way and important questions, everything from environmental policy to water quality, to education, to health, to policies having to do with how best to try to manage the pandemic has created a system where increasingly there's disparity among the states. There's growing inequality. And in fact, the inequality among the states is increasing. So that the, the major issue that we see is not only a, a kind of larger scale version of South Dakota versus Vermont, but also the fact that the, those patterns are becoming increasingly set, that they're becoming increasingly set in ways that it increase the inequities in the country. And so the basic question that we've got, the, the concern that I've got about why it is that federalism doesn't work is it's plowing the ground and creating the seeds for the kind of inequality in the country that I think in many ways is the root cause of so many issues that we have to try to face today. So Susie, I don't know whether you have some questions at this point, but I'm happy to, to go on and try to explain just the, the history of how we got here. Um, 
try the history a little bit because it is it is the only way in fact that we can understand the present uh the the history of this is is um it's not pretty <laughs> so could you talk to us for a moment about slavery sure and it is slavery in many ways according to some of the founders was what they called the original sin of the american republic it was a, an issue that uh, really lies at the at the core of the problems that we have today the, the issues in fact of inequality and the fact that the states are going in different directions is rooted in the american effort to try to deal with the issues of slavery way back at the beginning and of course everyone's familiar with the story about the writing of the constitution and the fact that there was the three-fifths rule that was put in that created different ways of counting black slaves compared to other citizens and the reason why in fact the founders did that was that they were as all of us are today very quick on doing the math about how the balance of powers would work and the problem is if you counted uh, they had already decided that they were going to have a uh, two representatives from each state in the Senate, but then how to apportion the House of Representatives. And so if you did it strictly on the basis of population, then the northern states would end up uh, in disproportionate advantage and they'd be able to ram their policies down the South's throat. On the other hand, if the slaves weren't counted at all, then the South would have a dramatic advantage and the North wasn't about to put up with that. And so they sat down on the back of an envelope, did the math, and it turns out that if you counted slaves with three fifths, it worked out just about evenly so that the North and the South had roughly even balance in the House of Representatives. So that this original sin that the American Republic was responsible for, this, this problem of not only failing to deal with slavery, but rooting it in the Constitution was largely a matter of trying to deal with the same kinds of issues we deal with today in reapportionment. And so that was the roots of the problem. But Having done that, that the founders then said, okay, we've, we've created this executive branch. We've created a legislative branch, the first branch in Article I, and the court, which was uh, at that point a kind of a fuzzy notion, even down to the number of justices, which the founders didn't specify at the beginning. But, and the issue went then out to the states. After all this work, they said, you know, you, you surely want to ratify this. And in particular, you need to ratify this because we had tried the American Republic 1.0 with the Articles of Confederation, which proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that that was not going to work very well. And so we needed to have something in having Madison in particular, having created this wonderful idea of the balance of powers, was sure that in fact the states would enthusiastically embrace it, which they did not. They said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we're not going to ratify this without some guarantee that the states themselves have power and that they have a particular power that was framed then in the 10th Amendment, which in some ways seemed redundant, that powers not explicitly given to the federal government are reserved for the states, but the states said without something like that, we're not going to ratify it. And so the 10th Amendment was put in as a kind of afterthought as a part of the Bill of Rights. Interesting that as we talk about the Bill of Rights, the role of the states is enshrined as part of that, and the states then got a power to be able to exist independently and presumably to be able to exercise powers that the federal government didn't have. So that seemed like a pretty bright line test that in particular in dealing with issues of slavery, that not only did the founders sidestep the question of what to do about slavery, not only did they do it in a way that created a kind of political balance of power in the Congress, but they also backed away from the question of dealing with it at the national level and reserved the powers to the states for sorting things out. So that seemed like a pretty bright line test, which uh, lasted for just only a couple of years, because the, there's also a series of clauses, including the general welfare clause in the Constitution, which the founders and then early leaders of the country said, you know, the, the general welfare can be stretched pretty broadly and it turns out, as we've discovered over time, to encompass almost everything. And so the idea of having a bright line between the federal government and the states began to erode almost right away. But still, what we had was the preservation of slavery, and in particular, the balance of power between slave and non-slave states that continued 
through the 1850s and it eventually ended up, as we all know, in the Civil War. But the Tenth Amendment, which seemed to be a bright line to try to prevent that from happening, in fact, ended up creating and sowing the seeds for the Civil War. Uh, we had, in fact, an effort to try to solve the problem of slavery and federalism by creating law and drawing strict boundaries. Now, that didn't work. So the North wins the Civil War. And in particular, there was the 14th Amendment that, uh, that ruled that we had a, the equal rights under the law, and that that seemed, of course, to have not only eliminated slavery, thanks to the Emancipation Proclamation, and eventually the, the, the celebration of Juneteenth. And how long did that last? It lasted as long as the states could get a handle on it and began to create separate but equal policies that the courts stepped back away from and did not challenge. And so we had the system that was based on bargaining and balance that preserved a lot of the conflicts that seemed to have been resolved by law, which didn't because it led to the, led to the Civil War. Then after the Civil War, we had a set of practice that was based on political balance, but in a way that created the second generation of federalism that was focused on the separate but equal doctrine, which really endured, as we know, until we got to the point of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That really lasted a really long time. Well, at that point, the Supreme Court stepped in and the third generation of, of federalism came in because the court ruled in nine to zero, a kind of really monumental achievement for Chief Justice Earl Warren of getting un unanimity in the court to argue that separate but equal was unconstitutional. And at this point, the federal government stepped in and first stepped in to try to deal with the issue of civil rights to nationalize the issue, to rule that the states did not have the power to impose unequal conditions on different citizens, that in fact, the era of civil rights was put into effect. This third generation uh, really uh, was set up by Brown versus Board of Education and found its capstone during the, the Johnson administration's New Deal with voting rights, civil rights, and a whole set of other kinds of legislation that was passed. But then in, in 1968, and thereabouts, things changed. The, the Medicare and Medicaid programs have been created. The, we had a series of other kinds of efforts that got back into a question, not so much of law, but of bargaining and a kind of fourth generation of federalism where the problem was trying to figure out how to balance the power between the federal government and the states. Uh, one of the things that we have to understand in particular is that increasingly healthcare became the flashpoint. Medicaid needs to be understood as a basic problem of federalism, that it became a problem of balancing the broad federal guarantees of basic health care for poor Americans through Medicaid with the process of also giving states a fair amount of flexibility in determining how to administer it. But in the process of doing that, we stepped away from the idea that citizens ought to be treated equally, because if you are eligible for Medicaid, we actually have 51 different Medicaid programs in the country with 50 states in the District of Columbia with administrative systems that, that frankly, nobody really quite understands. I'm convinced that there probably, there may be five people in the country that fully understand the way that Medicaid works. But the thing that we need to know is that healthcare is at the bottom, that Medicaid created a system of inequality among the states and how it is that healthcare was administered, that states went off in different directions. And that then set the stage for the debate over the Affordable Care Act and the Affordable Care Act itself also needs to be understood as a program founded in federalism, not only in terms of the state flexibilities that were given and the ability of states to decide whether or not to opt into special federal, uh, federal subsidies, but, but also in terms of how to try to deal with the mandate for health care, reinforced by the way in which the Supreme Court has operated with tremendous variability in the way in which yes. the government is approaching that. Don, how would you describe the balance today? Uh, and I think what we have is, uh, if, if you think of it in, in Hamiltonian versus Madisonian terms, which really is the, the, the basic framework that has been established, uh, what we have is a, is a musical that is still insanely popular based on Hamiltonian ideals and a practice that's based, in fact, on Madisonian ideals. We have a strategy that really is designed to try to give states tremendous flexibility, in part because the federal government just 
uh, really has its act together to decide what it is that it wants the states to do, that it's a lot easier to allow the states to sort this out. But what we have as a reflection of the growing, growing polarization of the country is also uh, battles that are being fought out state by state by state and state capitals. Uh, you, if you're lucky to, uh, to live in a state like Texas, where the Democrats of the legislature have hopped on a plane to get it out of town so that the governor can't push through some of his legislation, you see kind of shenanigans that in California would never be allowed to happen. And so what we have is tremendous variability that is very Madisonian in a way and very Jeffersonian, but in ways that I think really cause tremendous problems. First, in feeding polarization. Second, in feeding inequality. Is there, is there anything you see that portends a shift back to a more Hamiltonian model? Uh, not anytime soon, I think, because I think if you, the, the, the question of, of what happened with the pandemic is I yes. think instructive. Instructive, because it's a, a, a footnote, uh, when you're, if you bring your book out, it's probably a good idea not to have the publisher release it on the day that the NBA decided to cancel the finals. Yeah. So it's a, that was, it was about a year ago. But if you look at, so fast forward to, the, to today, what we've had is a system that not only allowed the states to, to work things out, but also at the federal level, a, a very conscious effort by the last administration to deflect as many important decisions down to the states as they possibly could. Uh, this administration has in, instead taken a somewhat more Hamiltonian approach in terms of deploying the vaccine and was insanely successful up to now, where it became clear that the variability among citizens and among the states is now creating vast inequalities in the numbers of people who are vaccinated state by state and therefore vulnerable to the spread of the vaccine. So that what we have, even in the Biden administration, even with an, with an effort to try to nationalize the process of getting vaccines, we now see enormous variability, which is creating yet another wave of inequality now founded in the odds that you're likely to get sick depending on where you live. That the problem and the challenge is that we have a country that the government that we get increasingly depends on where we live. And that's something that I think is, uh, is, is an enormous challenge. And the question is just how much variability are we likely to want to tolerate? How much, uh, how much tension and polarization do we, are we likely to tolerate given the fact that the, the states, I think increasingly, are responsible for the polarization that's being fed in the country. We tend to look at polarization as something that happens in Congress, which it is for sure, but yeah. so much of that is being fed in the states. Um, you wrote about that in your book, but now it has turned into a matter of life and death. Uh, and, and we will see how much we can tolerate of that kind of disparity. Uh, and uh, I note that Christy Nome of South Dakota is doubling down on the South Dakota model of freedom and personal responsibility. So she doesn't have a problem. Well, absolutely, she, she does it. And uh, for those of you who are fans of history, this sounds awfully familiar. We've seen this kind of debate about get the federal government's hands off of our programs and well, freedom and responsibility to allow us to go our own way, which was in part what fed the issue of slavery for a long time, and now yes. it's feeding inequality in a different kind of way. And so we have, have that. And so let me, let me frame the question though, because uh, if, you're, if you're gonna allow freedom and responsibility, and, and Eric Mencken asked in the chat, uh, freedom and personal responsibility is also the Vermont model, but a very different kind of way to try to encourage a fairer, amount of, of state control and, and state efforts to try to roll the vaccine out compared to South Dakota, which is that uh, we don't need no stinking vaccine because it's something that really interferes with individual right. choice. Yeah. And so the question is, uh, maybe, the, maybe the answer is to allow the states to go their own way and people can vote with their feet, depending on where they want to live and where they want to go. And we see the battle between California and Texas, for example, and everything from economic development to real estate to high tech. And uh, in the best American traditions will allow the markets to sort all that out. That's, that's a pretty risky strategy because it's creating huge inequalities among the states. 
And, and the, que the question, to put it in another way, is do we care if they die? And it's not clear what the answer is at this point. Yeah, because uh, we, we've got states where people are saying personal responsibility, we're going to go our own way, and uh, we're just, we'll take our chances. But the, the problem is that it, uh, it, it puts tremendous strains, for example, on the healthcare system and yeah. on hospital emergency rooms and intensive care units. And so it creates real resource questions. Uh, the other question, too, for what it's worth is that it'd be different if we uh, were, for example, like New Zealand, where it's thousands of miles in the middle of nowhere from anybody, surrounded by water. And so the experiments can be allowed to play themselves out. Yes. But uh, given the fact that we have air travel, we have cars, uh, the, the problem is that uh, you can be living in a place that's relatively safe and you could be one stop at a truck stop away from somebody spreading the disease from somewhere yeah. else into your state as well. So these things have tremendous spillover implications as well. That's right. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions. Uh, may I open the floor up to people raising their hands? William Hertz. Could yeah, you unmute uh, yourself? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. My question is, thank you. And I read your book uh, a while ago. Very good. Um, I mean, I learned a lot from it. Um, question is, given um, the political environment and the, the fact that federalism seems to be built into the conservative DNA and conservatives get an advantage from this rural urban divide, which advantages conservat conservatives electorally, what arguments do we muster to convince conservatives to favor a more uh, government, central government approach? I mean, is there an argument that uh, outside of the results that you're talking about politically, what can we say to our conservative friends to convince them that change is needed? And the, we can answer this at a, at a macro and a micro level. I think at the micro level, we can talk about operational issues and just to, to point to one really interesting small point, you know, one of the big challenges of fighting COVID has been the fact that we have never had a single national language to describe what it is and why it matters and how it's spreading. And if it weren't for the, the folks at Johns Hopkins early on, I shudder to think where we might have been and how that came into being itself was a, is a fascinating story. And if it were not for them, who knows where it is we would be and try even to discuss it. So at least creating a national language that uh, allows us to count the number of cases in a way that's consistent. So we know what we're talking about. That's one thing. Uh, at the macro level, I just, this is a place where I wish I had a better answer, but I don't because I think that what we've seen in the case of, of Medicaid, Medicaid expansion, what we've seen in the Affordable Care Act, and what we've seen, even in the case of the vaccine, uh, the virus, even before that, about uh, whether or not it's real, whether or not it's something people need to pay attention to. Those are, those are all issues, I think, on which there uh, simply is not, and I'm not sure that there easily can be a way to try to bring national unity on this, except for a strong call to action. But as we've seen, even with the Biden administration, with, with pleading coming from the president himself, we still have states that have decided uh, we're just going to go our own way. I think this, in many ways, uh, it's, uh, I think everybody who writes a book thinks that what they're doing is most important and most definitive. But I sort of think that of all of the issues that we face in this country, the question that you ask, uh, ask William is, I think, absolutely central. And it's central to our ability to be able to preserve ourselves as a country. We've got to find some way to be able to, to deal with those issues that truly are national. And we can see uh, how long that effort, uh, just a, a quick footnote, we, we seem to think with the passage of the Voting Act, Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act in the mid-60s mid that, wow, okay, after all this, we finally have solved the problem, which lasted as long as we, until the time that we started trying to implement Medicaid. And you can see that the forces that tend to shred the efforts at, un at unity, and that's the thing that's so important and so difficult. Barbara Brown. Could, could you unmute? I no, just unmuted. Thank you. So um, 
your original comparison was of two northern states, uh, one that I, I think is more highly educated uh, northeast versus, uh, you know, a bunch of, of what we call in Texas uh, deplorable rednecks uh, out, out in uh, the uh, northwest. And it seems to me then, I heard you just go back to this being a racial based issue, but in your state comparisons, right, we were basically looking at uh, two states which, which are not, I mean, if I, if I go down to Louisiana, heck yes, right? Uh, we're just not uh, vaccinating minorities, right? But uh, the two you compared, that's, that's not so. So how, how do we look at this issue of uh, you know, not only are we disadvantaging uh, people of color, but we're also disadvantaging poor, uneducated whites in, in some of these states. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we deal with that issue? And one of the things that I did in the book, because I was curious about exactly that question, about how much variability is there and where is it? And it turns out that I started looking at the pattern of performance on things like like road construction and substandard bridges and environmental policy and water quality of unemployment, about issues of trying to deal with, uh, with child poverty and child health. And, it, and I was expected to find some variability, but it turns out that everywhere I looked, there were these big differences on exactly the, the fault lines that you suggest between relatively poor states on the one side and richer states on the other, between people who live in some of those states and those who don't about the problems that Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana have by comparison to say Vermont and New York and in some cases, California. And so some of this is separating itself out along lines of income, which tend to disadvantage folks. And there was a, an interesting comment that the fact is that the, uh, the why people can vote with their feet. And that's the argument that's often used, which is great if you have the resources to be able to move. But if you're relatively uneducated or less educated, if you're relatively poor, it's really hard just to hop in the car and to be able to go someplace in the hope that you're going to be able to find a job and an affordable place to live. And so we have these patterns that are being reinforced. And it turns out that it's all the things that we find in COVID and the risks that we find right now are present in virtually every other policy area as well. And this is why I'm so worried about the, the kinds of patterns that are creating and the, the problems of the underlying uh, political tensions that are feeding it. So it's a great question, but I actually looked at that and the, the data are just remarkable. So we've transcended the racial problem. I suppose that's a step, a step forward. Um, and we've replaced it with a much deeper class problem. I think that's right. And part of it's captured by race, but also part of it is captured much more deeply by issues of of class and it's being reinforced now with the kind of party polarization as well, which tend to make people who are most vulnerable uh, of regardless of race, be in a position where they're not in favor of a government that would step in to try to resolve those issues. And in the sixties we had, again, we, we sort of thought we had figured this out that we would have national policy whose goal would be to try to level out the differences between the states. And we had model cities and, and the great society that was designed to do that which again, started to, to fly apart with centrifugal force in the 1970s and on. And it was based on the argument that we need to allow the states to grow their own way. And that's coming at an enormous cost. Is there, well, what, first, what, what is the relationship, do you think, between the structural features of federalism that seem to impel this uh, diver divergence and the political polarization that we associate with the Trump era. Yeah, and I th think the, the two in many ways are, are linked. Uh, my, my thought is that uh, for what it's worth, I, and Trump's great genius was not to, to lead the movement so much as he was to sense that a movement that was there and find a way to get to the head of the parade that a lot of these issues were out there and I think are, are deep and are based in, in 
not only differences among the states, but differences within the states as well. Uh, the, the, the shenanigans going on right now here in Texas are largely the product of a not only polarization, but a deep divide between relatively rural parts of the state and urban parts of the state. The, the Democrats who have taken off on a plane for Washington, for the most part, are representing uh, rural, uh, the urban areas and the, it's the, it's the rural areas that are in, interested in trying to create the so-called issues of, of voter fraud. And so it's, it's geographic, also class based on education and lots of other things. But it's, it is, uh, the question is, is that structural? And it's, uh, it is, uh, it's based in those kinds of things. So it wraps around the question of race, but then elevates the tensions in ways that now are infecting lots of other kinds of policy areas. It's, so I think the idea of transcending the, the race issue, because Ross raises a good, a good point. I think it's that the racial issues haven't gone away, but what's happened is they've gotten wrapped in and woven into so many other kinds of issues at the same time. That the people who in some ways have the hardest time dealing with racial issues are in many cases those who, who don't see the need to get vaccinated. And those are also the same kinds of areas where there's lower performance on schools and education, environmental quality, and a whole host of other things. We've really managed to screw ourselves, haven't we? No, we have. And this, you know, one of the, the arguments that's made sometimes that the, the forces most likely to, to cause democracies to die is the, the fact that great inequalities begin to grow. And it's not so much the corrosion or the attack from outside, but the, the corrosion from in. Indeed. Uh, and, and the Democrats fleeing the state, literally, is symbolic. Uh, Frank Fukuyama, question. Uh, hi, Don, can you hear me? I got a new microphone and I'm not sure it works. You sound terrific, Frank, actually. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, so Don, I like the book. I wrote a blurb for it and I think you started an important uh, debate. However, it's not clear to me uh, your criteria for deciding which um, issues really fall under the purview of the federal government. I mean, it seems to me historically the centralization of authority in Washington has really been driven by two things. One is foreign policy, which, um, you know, is really what concerned Hamilton uh, in the Federalist, that mm -hmm. foreign governments shouldn't be able to take advantage of internal divisions. But the other one was obviously race, was the history of slavery. And there, I think Lincoln, you know, fairly clearly said that there are certain moral principles of equality that no democratic majority in a state should be able to override. That was the essence of the Lincoln-Douglas debate. And I think we kind of settled that in, uh, in the, you know, with the passage of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and I think, therefore, that you would have to say that if the federal government got its act together and you know, uh, passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and really protected voting rights against these state uh, efforts to uh, manipulate election results. That's something that would clearly be uh, clearly be called for. That's the modern version of that uh, necessary intervention because it really is based on a fundamental right. But I don't understand why equality and health outcomes is such a fund fundamental issue. Uh, it kind of gets back to Susie's question about, you know, if South Dakota wants to follow these stupid policies and not make people wear masks and therefore more people die. I, I'm just not sure why that, I mean, that's too bad for the people that die, but, you know, they're, they actually have fundamentally chosen a set of uh, policies that, that led to that. And furthermore, it's just not clear to me, if you look back over the pandemic, whether we would have done better if the federal government had been able to set you know, national rules uh, regarding all these issues. Uh, the first problem is, you know, when the federal government is being run by a bunch of idiots, it means you're going <laughs> to impose really dumb policies on states. Uh, if you look at Michael Lewis's last book, um, The Premonition, it turned out that the CDC was actually opposed to social distancing and mask wearing and a lot of sensible things. Uh, and it was really the states that uh, led you know, states like California that led the early shutdowns. Uh, so, you know, when you impose a uniform set of policies on a big diverse country like the United States, you're maybe lifting up some of the states at the bottom, but you're also putting a cap on, you know, what more innovative and progressive states can do. And 
you know, and so it's just not clear to me that we would have been better off if we had been more like the European Union and tried to centralize everything, you know, from Brussels the way uh, uh, they did in their response to the pandemic. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, which uh, gets into lots and lots of different kinds of puzzles. Let me let me say first that all all countries, all governments from time immemorial have had to try to find a way to deal with the question of centralization and decentralization. Uh, that's not a particularly federalism kind of kind of issue. It's something that everybody deals with. What's different here is that we have a country where we have created independent power centers with the unusual ability to be able to both shape national policy from below and to uh, influence the implementation of policy from uh, the across the states as well. There, there are a couple issues though, and because I think we have to. I think, uh, I, I guess the response I'd have is it's not a federal government only or state government only kind of response. But let me, I think, and again, the, the, the fact that we were able to learn by the experiences, especially in, from states like Washington, that uh, was the, the early center of things and which then was in the, if uh, there have been some analyses that have suggested that if all the states had followed what it is that Washington learned, that we would have had hundreds of thousands of fewer deaths because of the strategies that we, we would have used. So uh, the, these, these questions of centralization and decentralization are eternal, but they're different in the United States because it's independent power centers. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I don't think this necessarily argues that everything has to be run from Washington or from the CDC in Atlanta. A uh, couple points. First, that uh, South Dakota doing what South Dakota wants to do is of course up to the people of South Dakota, but one of the things that we have in response is a one word answer, which is Sturgis. There was a major motorcycle rally as there is every year there. And uh, it, that turned out to be one that suggested that the single biggest super spreader event in the course of the vaccine, that, that people came biking in and then succeeded in, in spreading it to people in South Dakota, but also taking it back to on their cycles to wherever it is that they lived. And so one of the arguments is that the, the states are not self-contained and the issues and the problems that they create spill over to other states as well. That's one point. The second point is that at, at the very least, uh, I think that we need to have some, some basic data tracking, for example, where everybody's speaking the same language. Uh, it, it turns out that, that states have had wildly different ways of trying to measure what a case was, about what the death rate was, about a whole variety of things that are absolutely essential for understanding and what we've created is a kind of tower of federalism babble, where states are speaking different language, which makes it impossible for them to figure out what they're doing, to figure out what it is that they're doing well, to make it hard to try to figure out which states are doing better, and to try to find ways of creating these laboratories of democracy so that we have something actually approaching a lab. So that I think uh, we, we need continual, uh, considerable subtlety in, in not arguing that everything needs to be run from Washington, but at the same time, understanding that the risks of allowing the states so much authority to be able to go their own way has risks for everybody else as well, too, on top of it, especially given the fact that if you have something like pollution about uh, issues about public health, that these are things that, uh, that, that really uh, transcend the interests of individual states. Should local governments be allowed to run their local schools? And the answer there, I think, is pretty clearly yes. Uh, should local governments be in a position to be able to, to count COVID any way they want? Uh, well, perhaps, but it, that creates an enormous challenge of uh, having the country being able to respond. So I think what we need is a, is a much more subtle conversation, but the problem is that it's very hard to do that, given the fact that the polarization within the states is driving the polarization and the House of Representatives in particular. And because of that, it's making it increasingly hard for the national institutions to to operate. I, I would argue, even though we focus on polarization in Washington, I would argue that it's really driven by, by growing polarization in the states and that that's the, the product of it as well. So I think we need a, a way to be able to un, unpack some of this stuff. And were, were it not for, as I said before, the, the efforts by the folks at Johns Hopkins, it's unclear whether we would have been able to have any kind of decent conclusion about what we're doing. Forget what the policy ought to be, just what it is that's actually happening out there. But it's a great question, uh, Frank. I, we, we could go on for another two hours on this one, I think. Henry McHenry, would you like to unmute yourself? 
Yes, hello. Uh, in Charlottesville, we think we've transcended the issue of race and maybe therefore the issue of polarization by removing Confederate statues from public view. You've done that, yes. Race conflict, race conflict is only a subset of tribal animosity and suspicion. Um, is there a government structure that? Uh, I mean, this, this really explosive government structure. And one of the things I've, I actually was on the faculty at the University of Virginia for 10 years. And so I had to not only know those statues well, but also uh, the, the trip to Monticello was a pilgrimage we made with every visitor who came. And so know all that stuff well. And one of the things I was always struck by was that, that Jefferson himself was surprisingly Hamiltonian as a president, that the, the idea of allowing state governments to just go their own way and dictate policies and the national government have this narrow piece of policy realm would in fact have made it impossible to, for the federal government and for Jefferson to do the Louisiana Purchase, which is one of the, the, the most Hamiltonian acts of the American Republic. But at the same time, the idea of trying to figure out how to deal with the underlying issues of race was something that, that continued underneath the surface. And so we, we have this problem of America's original sin and the challenge of figuring out how to deal with it. And the, the question that in fact flows into today about trying to, trying to determine what to do about issues of race, which I think what's now clear is that we, we surely have not resolved it. And, and picking up and moving a couple of statues away, as you suggested, uh, doesn't really solve the problem in any kind of way. It, at, uh, in some ways, maybe creates new flashpoints, flashpoints that perhaps we need to have, but we still have the, these challenges and the tensions that end up sitting under, underneath the surface, and in some cases, very clear. John Allen? Thank you. This is a very, very interesting discussion, and I appreciate John and everything he's had to say. I have a question. He uses Vermont, and South Dakota as examples, but there's so much more under the surface that we don't understand, uh, you know, from from South Dakota. I mean, my, one of my questions is: is the uh, are the vaccinations readily available to everybody in South Dakota, or has the government prevented that from happening? And 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 the next part of that is: do we really know uh, if people that have COVID, if they're really, uh, I, I think part of the problem is, and I agree with him, we have, don't have a national uh, definition of what we're talking about. Everybody defines it differently. But, you know, the, the science is telling me, from my definition, that people that have been exposed to COVID aren't in, aren't in danger of getting any of the new variants. They have a natural immunity. Do we know what's going on? Do we really understand that? And those are my questions. And, and the answer is, I think, no that we really don't have it, in part because we haven't succeeded in creating the kind of basic metrics to be able to deal with this. And, and we, we have to, we're, do, we're doing science in real time. And it's, uh, it, it took us a long time to figure out whether the earth or the sun was the center of our local universe. And it took a lot of debates over a long time, but we're doing uh, fundamental science in real time and the question of trying to figure out what vaccines to use and what their effect is and how much immunity that exposure to the virus can actually convey. Those are all things we're trying to sort out. And now we're trying to figure out whether or not we even need to get, uh, to get jump started with a kind of booster vaccine. And uh, with the suspicion in the background that Pfizer is trying to push this because they see dollar signs in their eyes as well. And so those are all questions that we were really not prepared to, to answer. But the, the Think about the question of the, should we and do we need booster shots? And so if we, if we allow complete market operations to, to happen, then what's gonna happen is that anybody who has a, a product to sell is going to make an argument that we really need to do it. That's the case, it seems to me, where a, a, a national conversation based on the best available science is something that if it doesn't at least set the policy for everyone else, at least ought to inform it. That's clearly one of those cases that ought to be, ought to be nationally informed. Uh, one of the things I, I don't know for sure, but I believe is that in South Dakota, the vaccinations are pretty widely available. There's a national program of trying to push them out through a series of large pharmacy chains and they have them just like everybody else. So the vaccines I believe are readily available and it's a matter of individual choice about whether or not to get them accepted. So we have on the one hand, the question of what kind of issues ought to be national and 
the having each state do its own independent science about whether or not we need a booster is probably not a good idea. But on the other hand, trying to find ways of developing a vaccination program that is based on the way in which individuals uh, get in, encounter the healthcare system and which pharmacies they go to, on the other hand, is something that requires a lot of, of local fit. And so that's why the, the idea of leave it all to the feds or leave it all to the states, I think, is, is, is dangerous because it, it misses the most important areas where we can try to move things forward. Sasha Ricard? Hi. Um, I'm interested, this is changing the subject a little bit from the, the COVID conversation, but um, you, you made the claim a couple times that you think polarization is much more of a state, like state issue, state by state, mm -hmm. rather than internally or sort of a, a more local um, problem. And I was hoping you could elaborate on that a little bit because it's, and maybe you cover it in the book, but that's not something that I've heard argued before. And, and when I think about states like Washington or Oregon, where you have sort of these really dramatic internal divisions, it seems like it's harder to maintain that it's a state by state polarization versus, you know, even internally and yeah. even within individual cities where you see folks who have different political beliefs, really yeah. not even ever interacting. And so I'm, I'm curious how you draw that conclusion, if you could allow yeah, it. I guess I'm from the Tip O'Neill School of Political Science, which is that all politics are local and that the issues at the at the federal level are the product of of tensions at the local level, that that politics, I think, flows uphill in this case, that the uh, the reason why, for example, that the Republicans have ran have run so far away from January 6th in Washington is that they're not they're mostly concerned about primary challenges. And the primary challenges would be rooted in what happens in, in the local communities and whether or not they can maintain their base of support to fight those primary challengers off. So I think there's that piece. There is, as I said, the, the, the special case here in Texas right now with, with Democrats representing urban centers against Republicans representing more rural areas. And so we see those kind of tensions. And the and then every and then we have a governor trying to to, to out Florida Florida and Florida trying to out Texas Texas and so those we have those kind of competitions going on as well. So the argument that I would make is that we have a case where polarization flows uphill from the states, based in all these grassroots kinds of issues, based in, in primaries, based in primary challenges, based in redistricting, which of course is a is a state legislative battle. That what what legislative district that you represent is the product of the ability of people. Uh, on your party to be able to draw the district in a way that most benefits you. Uh, I live in an incredibly squirrely district that has a little tiny slice of Austin that with a boundary that runs all the way down to San Antonio, which is 90 miles away. There's this little tiny sliver that is very, very tall north and south and very skinny east and west. And it's because the Republicans had control and that they then succeeded in drawing the lines in a way that benefited a particular incumbent. And that particular incumbent is now one of the most radical voices in terms of fighting against the Biden administration. And he can do it because the Republicans drew the boundary in a way that uh, created a way to essentially disenfranchise Democrats who lived in Austin in favor of those who live in more rural areas. And then that created that foundation which is polarizing Washington. So I think that's the way in which the, some of these dynamics work. Uh, Don, that that is very interesting because we are we're fond of talking about this problem as a Washington problem, and you're suggesting no, it's not that easy to fix. No, it's not that easy to fix, and it's part of the the ongoing piece. I guess if there's anything that that I would argue and a thought that I would want to make sure to leave everybody with is not only this challenge of inequality, but the fact that, that federalism lurks everywhere. And that uh, we, we tend to think about some of these issues as nationally centered, or in particular, the way that the national media tend to cover these things. But you can look at almost anything that matters in the domestic policy sphere. And with a little bit of scratching, just barely below the surface, Hit issues of federalism unless we understand not only the historical roots of federalism but the way in which they're playing themselves out today uh, we're missing everything that matters 
including some of the most important questions about the future of the country, I think. And on that cheering note, <laughs> Luke, are we out of time? Uh, yes, yes. And sorry, everybody, that we couldn't get to all the questions. There will hopefully be many more conversations on this topic moving forward. Uh, let's uh, take it back to Jeff to uh, do a final closeout. So, so, Luke, thank you. My, my job, everybody, is not to keep you, but, but to thank. And I want to start with you, Luke, and all you've done and all Braver Angels does. And we're always pleased and, and honored to cooperate with America's Public Forum. Thanks to all of you for your valuable time, including, by the way, Frank Fukuyama, our co-founder of American Purpose and chairman of our editorial board. Thanks, Susie Garment. Gosh, if you haven't read Susie's article on Professor Kettle's book in American Purpose, please do so. You can find it online and in chat. Susie, what a lovely job of managing and leading the conversation today. Uh, to you, Professor Kettle, gosh, biggest thanks, warmest thanks. I don't have the physical book to, to hold up. I know that's best form, elegant form. We've got the Kindle form, but I don't have that. But it is called um, America's Divided ah, States. Good. It's Princeton University. Thank you. The Divided States of America, <laughs> Princeton University, 2020. Uh, if you don't have it, look at it, read it, buy it, please, if I may say. Um, Don, we, as you know, are fond, you've heard this from Susie today, we're fond of history, we're fond of context, we're fond of learning. We learned, I learned a lot from you today. I think I speak for everybody in this gallery that we believe in America, in making things better, in fixing things that are broken. And to have you with your knowledge and expertise and clarity, I just think this was a real privilege. So Don, Professor Kettle, thank you very, very much for your valuable time. The last thing I wanna say, you know, often if you've joined these with us before, um, I like to ask people if you're in a position to do so, to turn on your cameras at the very end. I'm gonna mend that a little bit, ready? If you see in the gallery, Mike Morton, and that handsome picture of a hound dog. Mike, I was looking for you with a hound dog. We'll take you. That's a gorgeous dog. If you can turn on your cameras, wave, say hello, goodbye. Really appreciate your time. Thank you all very much. What a great conversation. Really good. Have a great day. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks so much to everybody. Thanks for the great questions, too. Thank you, chats. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Thank you.